Hey everyone, thanks and welcome to uh, our first ever mock interview with Fuqua. I'm here with Morgan. Uh, I'm going to let her take over and tell us what we are doing today. But before that, Fuqua is kind enough to uh, ha have us give over 200 app fee waivers. So the prize drawing and the link, we'll share it in the chat sometime during this video. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And Morgan, tell us what we are doing today. Yeah, so we are going to do a mock interview. We know this is the part of the application that uh, can be a little anxiety inducing because you don't know what to expect in these. So what we're going to do is we're first going to do about a 20 minute mock interview, um, kind of just what would a typical question in an MBA admissions interview be like. We'll then give a brief debrief of what went well, what didn't go well, um, then explain what happens after the interview, the mysterious pull back the curtain, let you know what happens. And then we'll also leave time for if there's any questions or anything like that. Um, so for this, I will be acting as if I am a second year student. They are the ones that mostly conduct our interviews. Sometimes it is an alum. Um, and so we will kick, kick things off right away. Um, and so usually these are behavioral interviews. So keep that in mind too, as we're going through that. So Suvik, thank you so much uh, for meeting with me today. I'm excited to see that you are applying to Fuqua. Uh, before we really dive into things, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Morgan. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, you know, uh, growing up in uh, a, a big city in India, uh, I, I had no other real option but to do engineering for my undergrad. So uh, I ended up majoring in electrical engineering, graduated to join a big German engineering company called Siemens, uh, spent some time uh, working through very large, complex projects um, across India, worked with the government for a long time. And, you know, like my, one of the things that I'm really proud of in that experience was really understanding how government contracts work, uh, how complex bureaucracies uh, need to function to, um, to you know, sign large deals with the private sector, with uh, creating public-private partnerships and things like that. Uh, I did that for two years, but I was also volunteering on the side with a not-for-profit called Teach for India, which is the same umbrella org as Teach for America, uh, that, um, you know, places um, early uh, professionals or recent graduates to underserving schools. And I felt that I was looking forward to more of my volunteering time than my uh, full-time uh, job. So that kind of really pushed me to ask my boss at Siemens that, hey, I really want to do this full-time. Um, can I take uh, like a sabbatical, uh, do this thing for two years? Teach for India tends to be a two-year full-time commitment. Um, and then uh, they were kind enough to let me do that. So I taught for two years. I taught middle and high school. I taught math and writing in a uh, really underserved school in uh, Bombay. And I taught about 100 students. And that was a fairly transformative experience for me. Um, uh, me and uh, five of my uh, co-fellows from Teach for India, uh, we were able to increase... Um, the reading comprehension and math levels of our students by three grade levels within two years, uh, which, you know, was really challenging. The, the biggest accomplishment from that experience was actually getting buy-in from parents. And, you know, these are the parents who have uh, daily um, labor jobs. And so it's really challenging for them to be invested in their kids' education, something that you know, we often take for granted, right? So getting them invested in their education, uh, creating and fostering engagement from different stakeholders, whether it's the parents or it's the school leader or it's other teachers uh, was incredibly difficult, but really rewarding when we saw metrics and learning outcomes improvement. Um, I did not go back to Siemens after uh, two years were over. I wanted to stay in education, but just looking at my background, I wanted to, um, you know, do, uh, I, I wanted to see how I can scale some of the impact that I've been able to uh, make as a teacher. So I joined an ed tech startup um, in India, uh, working with uh, tens of thousands of school, 
creating curriculum, creating learning management system, and really upskilling teachers and school leaders into using tech to uh, better scale their learning opportunities and learning outcomes for their students. So I did that for two years. I think uh, the biggest takeaway from that experience was that uh, it's, hi it's highly unlikely if you're going to ask teachers to do more work than they already do, that they're already very underpaid for. So any tech solution that you end up building um, should be mission driven in uh, taking in giving time back to teachers, making their lives easier. So uh, I think that was a really good experience in really understanding your customer, uh, really understand their pain points and have um, a critical understanding of their journey rather than be prescriptive on what you think your customers need. So that was a really good experience. Um, all this while, you know, I was about six years out of undergrad and I was, uh, as, as I was looking back into uh, my career, I feel now that I'm kind of hitting a ceiling where uh, I think um, maybe I can stay on longer in an ed tech industry and scale up the schools that I tend to have an impact on, sure, but it's not going to be dramatically different than what I've already done before. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, why I'm here today, uh, why I think an MBA makes a lot of sense for me uh, to, to, to look at how I can translate what I have learned to other industries, to other, to solve other challenges. And uh, yeah, that's, that's why I'm here today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, and certainly I think one of the big things about getting your MBA is the leadership skills um, you learn in these programs. How would you describe your your leadership style uh, specifically with the most recent company that you've been with? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, my leadership style uh, has evolved over time. Uh, but I think the the trait that has really worked for me uh, is, um, you know, uh, having empathy uh, for your stakeholders. And I don't, um, and I don't mean having empathy um, as just uh, being, being kind to people or uh, understanding where they're coming from, but actually using empathy as a strategic framework in how we build products and we build solutions. So to, to, to give you a very specific example, uh, we were developing a, a teacher training app. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was scale up to as many curriculum as possible, right? Because we wanted to have this app used by thousands, if not millions of teachers across India, right? Um, and so we built that, we deployed that. Lots of teachers were... Uh, we're really happy to download that app and start to use it. But we saw a really, really sharp drop off uh, very early in the sign up process. And when we were really analyzing what went wrong, uh, we realized that uh, all of our programs and training curriculum were in English, uh, whereas most teachers in India, uh, you know, even though they might be teaching an English medium school, that was our focused segment, they're not very comfortable themselves with uh, learning things in uh, when the medium of inst instruction is English. And um, that to me was a good reflection on why uh, you needed to be empathetic. And that was a good turning point for me. So we kind of pivoted, we did, we spent a fair bit of time really digging deep into not just the language that my teachers would be comfortable with, but the environments, their bandwidth, their, by bandwidth, I mean internet bandwidth uh, on like, you know, what the uh, package sizes needed to be, the time that they had to devote on learning stuff on their own after a full solid day of teaching, mm -hmm. just including those variables, which were really absent from product design in the past, really helped us make a much stronger product with much stronger engagement. So uh, that is something that I take away from that experience and, uh, being more empathetic to our user, being more empathetic to the people that we work with actually ends up helping uh, the product that we build and the business that we run. Wonderful. 
Fantastic. You know, you, you talk about the, this great experience of working in this, this ed tech company. You mentioned before that you worked at Siemens, you did Teach for America. So you bring a lot of different experiences. How do you plan on bringing those experiences um, to enhance the MBA experience of your peers or future cohort? Yeah, and that, no, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, you know, I have spent a fair bit of time in uh, talking to current students and alums. And I was specifically trying to find people who kind of mirror my experiences and mirror my resume. So I think there are two big ways where I can contribute. So people who have been uh, in ed tech or who have been in education in the past and uh, are trying to pivot away from it, uh, such as me, right? And having same goals actually help us be on the same boat uh, change, exchange notes on, you know, what industry we are looking at, what functions we are looking at. And, uh, you know, misery loves company. So uh, just being able to foster that connection as a part of Team Fuqua is, I think, uh, really helpful uh, as an environment. The second thing, uh, the second group of uh, people that I think I can have an impact on are people who are not necessarily in ed tech, but are trying to pivot to ed tech from a non-education or a non-technical industry. And I think here's where, uh, you know, just being in this industry for five years and being in a segment where, you know, we have worked with schools in India, we have worked with schools in Singapore. Uh, so we have a pretty, pretty decent grasp of uh, the Asian market where ed tech is one of the top industries, much more so than most of the, uh, you know, the Western world. So being able to share some of that experiences, bring leaders, from those industries, whether it's at the symposium or whether it's in the education club or the tech club um, will help my peers who are trying to get a broader view. Maybe they grew up in the US, maybe they haven't had the opportunity to actually understand how ed tech is um, in, the, in the different corners of the world, you know? So I think that's where uh, I can bring real value. So those are the two ways I plan on engaging, uh, making the community stronger. Wonderful. Um, you know, certainly when, especially if you're starting a company, um, kind of going back to a little bit of your leadership um, and working on teams, um, you know, sometimes you can have differing opinions, differing perspectives, you know, as we men you mentioned, you know, bringing the perspective of ed tech to a cohort. A lot of times we can see that reflected in business. Um, can you talk about a time maybe where you had to work with people uh, of differing opinions or different strategies and, and how you worked to bring those people together and, and was successful? in coming up with a, a solution or, or an idea or, a, you know, an amicable census among the group? Yeah, um, you know, this happens a lot when you're working with uh, different stakeholders who all have uh, different interests on uh, and, and different vision for, uh, for the success um, of a project or a product. And I think uh, not being... Um, very clinically aligned and uh, not having extreme clarity on what that success is um, tend to pose a lot of challenges when uh, you know the rubber hits the road. Uh, so um, this, uh, I'll, I'll talk about an experience in my second year of uh, school uh, in, in Teach for India where um, the school had a fairly comprehensive um, after school program. And, uh, and it was also expensive. So, you know, the students had to, uh, well, their parents had to actually pay to be a part of that after school program. And it was kind of an open secret that, you know, you, you go to that after school program and your grades like magically get better. Uh, and we were fairly opposed to that uh, for obvious reasons. Like, like you know, like parents uh, already have a hard time affording school itself. Uh, so, you know, uh, throwing money at a different, as, as, as an alternative school system in the same school um, felt really strange uh, to us. The second reason we were uh, sort of opposed to it was also because um, we didn't feel that the quality of instruction um, was all that different in the after school program. It, it, it was the same teachers, it was the same curriculum. So we didn't um, really understand the value that this after school program uh, would would provide, uh, and the, so you know when we um, this was high school, uh, this is a very common thing in uh, Indian high schools. Um, so when we were approached by our school principal that hey, like you know you need to get your students enrolled in this after school program, 
um, we kind of resisted initially and uh, our knee-jerk reaction was to just say no and be very outright about it. Um, so we were, you know, we were passionate young uh, teachers and we didn't want to, and, and we were very happy to like challenge the status quo, right? Um, but then uh, when we did that and we had a conversation, uh, we, we faced our, we, we kind of made our school principal uh, an enemy uh, in that process, which was, uh, which was not great because, you know, we had to maintain a good relationship with them. And, um, and honestly, it was very easy to do that. It, it, it was very easy to think of this uh, person who is trying to uh, be some sort of like a, a money-minded individual, uh, turn, turn them into an enemy. So we kind of reached out to uh, older teachers in the school and uh, asked them for, for some advice. And uh, to our surprise, they were actually a, a, a lot more receptive to the school principal's uh, point of view. And uh, we were like, what are you talking about? This sounds like a corrupt system. And they were uh, trying to you know, tell us about how budgets work, how the light stays on. And we realized it was almost impossible for the school to even run from the direct revenue that it would get. The school would also make a lot of concessions for parents who could not pay. So there, there needed to be, there need money needed to come in uh, to actually keep the school in order, pay the teachers on time and things like that. And that made us um, really empathetic about the school principal. And um, and the next time we approached him, uh, we actually wanted to be intentionally collaborative. We wanted to understand his motivation. We actually wanted to understand the delta in revenue that the school needed to cover, right? So we did that. And just doing that, asking some rather um, uncomfortable questions uh, actually helped our school principal become an ally and very transparent in the shortfalls and the gaps for the budget year, uh, the planning for the next cycle and things like that. And we raised that uh, concern with Teach for India, uh, which kind of, you know, uh, our, our classroom was really high performing. So Teach for India uh, in no way would want to antagonize or cancel the relationship with the school. So we started a fundraising campaign um, with, you know, we, we made a lot of, we actually get, got help from our school principal in getting student artifacts as a part of the campaign and, you know, giving our donors thank you cards from, from our students that were handwritten, that were hand painted and all of that, we were able to generate well over uh, the amount of money that we needed to keep the lights on and to keep the budget in check. So we were able to reach a very happy solution. It just took us a long time because we were so incredibly headstrong and um, and honestly, uh, you know, standing on a pedestal that we really didn't deserve to stand. Uh, so moving forward, I think uh, the way I try to deal with conflict is uh, really dig deep into motivations. I think nobody wants to stall progress. I think nobody, most people have good intentions in mind. So being able to uncover motivations and intentions and uh, try to reach common ground um, is is often brings uh, turns uh, you know antagonists into allies and partners, which is something that I consciously try to look forward to. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and and last, you know, you've decided to apply to Fuqua. Um, what has made you say that Fuqua is the right school for you? Where you want to pursue your MBA? Things you might be excited about? Why Fuqua? Yeah, um, you know, I kind of grew up and lived in big cities in India uh, all my life. So uh, my undergrad was in a really big city and uh, being in a somewhat small town environment that kind of becomes a forcing mechanism uh, for you to build a community with the people who are going through the same experience is really important to me. And uh, Fuqua does a really good job in not only fostering that community, but making a brand out of it. So, you know, every single student that I've spoken to, uh, Team Fuqua always comes up. Uh, it never fails to come up. And that kind of camaraderie is something that I didn't get uh, in my undergrad, where my relationship with my peers, I mean, sure, I met friends uh, 100%, but it wasn't a community. Uh, I gravitated to people who were similar to me. I gravitated to people who I liked, rather than being forced to engage with, you know, diversity. So I think that's uh, the number one reason I like Fuqua. 
The other thing is, you know, my background is in tech. I want to pursue tech as my post MBA career. And um, be it in the curriculum, in the symposium, uh, in the tech club, or in the innovation lab, um, Fuqua has carved out a niche to um, foster uh, an environment where people pursuing tech actually thrive, especially when uh, they're, they're, they're looking at not just big tech, but also niche tech. So Fuqua mm -hmm. has a pretty strong uh, focus on fintech, a uh, pretty strong focus on uh, new tech that um, that is not yet proven to be uh, revenue positive. So I think that's the area that I want to dabble in. I think Fuqua is a really strong incubator to make that happen. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, so this kind of concludes our, our mock interview. And that went by I think very fast, much faster than probably an MBA missions interview is going to go. Um, so what we want to kind of talk through now is, is what worked well and what didn't work well. Um, yeah. So um, anything top of mind for you that you wanted to share of what went well or what didn't or advice or would you like me to kick off? Um, I think, you know, uh, the big thing that I faced when I was answering questions, uh, regardless of whether it's now or, you know, when, when I've done it in the past, is um, not having the structure in front of me. And like, in my mind, I'm ha hunting for the next thing to say. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about um, your advice on how do I create like a mental map of the whole answer uh, even before I start speaking. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think in, in listening to a lot of your um, responses, and again, for the, the folks watching, these were not scripted. These generally were asked without knowledge. Um, I, I think what's always really good, what you did a really good job with was kind of broadly sharing, here's how I'm going to answer the question. And kind of like you did a great job, especially with um, the what you bring. You talked about, you know, here's the group of people that, maybe don't want to be in ed tech. Here's people that want to move into ed tech. You kind of provide some examples and then wrapping it back to kind of state in a quick summary, one or two sentences of here's my answer and a short little nugget of that. I think that's always important when you're thinking of structuring things is thinking of how would I answer this? Let me give a quick, quick summary, almost like an agenda when you're doing a slide deck or a presentation and then wrap it back to answering the question. I think that is always helpful when you're thinking of structuring your questions um, or answers to those MBA questions. Yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. Uh, sometimes uh, this happened when I was like, when I was at Michigan, I was interviewing for jobs, right? I, I was talking to a second year student about like, oh, I mean, I, I kind of uh, forget what the question was in the middle of answering it. And she gave me like the best piece of advice. You have a piece of paper, write down the question yeah. and it's that easy. And, uh, and I, and I tend to do that. I didn't do that today, but I think that's really, really good advice. Yeah. And it's okay. Even if you're starting to talk and you're like, wait a second, I feel like I'm going off topic. Can you just repeat that question again? So I make sure I'm answering it. I think that is totally fine. We're all human. Um, and certainly it's fine to ask that in an admissions interview. Um, That's really awesome because I, I would reiterate that because for a lot of us who are interviewing, well, I'm not interviewing anymore. It's been a while. But uh, for a lot of people who are interviewing would think that asking a question like that would reflect poorly on them. Yeah. Well, I think we also understand, you probably remember this when you were interviewing, we understand it's anxiety inducing. You're very nervous. You feel like you've got 45 minutes to make your shot. Um, and, and so it's fine. Sometimes the nerves get the best of you. And if you just need to stop and say, I just want to make sure I'm answering this correctly. Can you just repeat the question for me so I make sure I'm, I'm answering it? So completely fine. I think one thing we were talking about before folks joined is probably no matter where you interview, um, even MBA admissions or a job, they're always going to ask you, tell me about yourself. Tell me a little bit about you just to kind of set the stage. Um, and typically in an interview, we'll have different schools, will have different components of the application. For Fuqua, we just have the one page resume. So usually we kind of have a sense of what was your work experience and we can kind of follow your story and follow that resume. Um, one thing we talked about a pitfall that a lot of people fall into and Suvik, you did a great job of kind of um, highlighting this is um, 
you know, you can go back many, many, many years and decades and talk about yourself. Um, and usually we're asking for that, tell me about yourself. We're looking for like a two, three, maybe at most five minute pitch. Um, yeah. And that can be hard. And this is one question that I think for people, when you are looking at doing your admissions interview and prepping, when people say, how can I prep? I always say, practice your two to three minute pitch of tell me about yourself. Don't need to go into every single detail of your work, um, but you want to highlight major things and kind of almost provide, at least for Fuqua, as we're reading the resume, as you're talking, I can say, okay, yep, they were at Siemens, Teach for India. I see that. Okay, cool. I'm understanding this correctly. Um, yeah. Any advice on tackling that question? Um, you know, I think just just so that we're clear, uh, this question, we actually talked a little bit before the video and one of the things that Morgan talked about and which I saw and almost everybody I've spoken to, people tend to ramble because they don't have a structure here, right? So I wanted to spend more time on the Siemens experience and give it more time than it deserved because it has nothing to do with my career goals. It has nothing to do with what I actually want to do. Uh, and I only spent two years there, right? So that was, I, I wanted you to get bored by it. And then towards the end, I wanted you to think about, uh, what was the point of this whole Siemens thing? Mm -hmm. I could have probably just glossed over it and moved on. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that I thought I um, shouldn't have done, I'm, I'm curious about your feedback on this one. Uh, I, I kind of made a like a six self-deprecating joke about like, oh, well, I'm from India. So of course I did engineering. I, I'm curious about what you feel about that because one of the things that I've noted about um, from people who, let's say, are in the U.S., right? Um, there is a significantly more diversity in undergrad majors among mm -hmm. American students than mm -hmm. in Indian students, right? Whereas Indian students, by default, end up going to engineering. Mm -hmm. So uh, when American students talk about um, their reasoning and their rationale for their undergrad, um, they can actually have a story. Uh, well, you know, I, I I was really curious about this thing. That's why I started to do microeconomics and blah blah blah. For Indians, uh, often I, I I hear like boilerplate responses, right? I was really curious about Rubik's cube as a child, and that inspired me to do engineering, which sounds really silly to me. So I'm curious, what would be your advice in um, very overrepresented candidates trying to explain their career choices? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, I think it's important to share what what was your educational background, because in some cases that's going to set the stage or be the reason of like, I studied this in undergrad. So that's why I work for this company. But now I'm wanting to make a pivot or um, kind of sometimes we'll look at things and say, this is a very non-traditional background. Why are you looking at getting an MBA? So I think explaining it. But to your point, spend a brief bit of time. We don't need to go back to your childhood and a Rubik's Cube. Um, we want you to be succinct. Um, yeah. That's going to be something that the Career Management Center is going to work with our students on as well. So I think that's why we say, like, it's fine to mention it. Hey, I went to college. I was an engineer. After that, I started working at Siemens. And I think that would be a fine transition. Um, yeah. Don't focus so much on like, what was your choice for undergrad? We're trying to figure out what is your choice for getting your MBA. And I think you did a great job um, in this of you kind of almost answered the next question, which we usually ask is, OK, why is now the right time to get your MBA? You brought that back of I've gotten to this point. I feel like I've hit my limit in order for me to move up or continue growing this company. I need an MBA because of this. I think that's really important. That's what we're more focusing on, not yeah. how did you get to the point now? It's how are you here and what are you wanting to do with that? So think of it a little yeah. bit in that way. Yeah, that was that was kind of thought intentional. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit rusty, but that's a trick that I learned from, from someone is like, I know you're interested in why MBA. I know you're interested in why now, why Fuqua. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to like give you some of the breadcrumbs and sometimes I would say stuff like, you know, like, let's say you're asking me why MBA, I would try to weave in why Fuqua. And then and I'll tell you something like, you know, uh, I'm happy to talk about that if you'd like to know why Fuqua specifically mm -hmm. uh, as like a teaser uh, to make sure that, you know, I have prepped why Fuqua. Uh, so that was kind of sort of intentional. I think it also helps me to have a thread in my responses and uh, not have to end awkwardly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, one quick question about the tell me about yourself before we move on. Um, mm -hmm. 
I didn't talk about like my personal interests or my hobbies at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious what what would be your take for that? Yeah, I think sometimes that is helpful. Some people will spend put a lot of that on their resume. Um, and again, every business school is is different. Some they'll, some might see different components. Um, I think if you have time as part of that pitch, I think we all recognize like you have your professional side. But what are you? you know, personally, who are you? What, what sparks your passion? I think that can be helpful. That can also be helpful in building rapport. You never know who your interview is. And I've had students come out that said, like, I mentioned in my tell me about myself, like how much, like, and when I'm not working, I enjoy playing board games. And my interviewer started the board game club at Fuqua. And it was a really cool connection and kind of fosters more of that conversation. So I think it's perfectly fine to add in maybe one or two like interests that you are particularly passionate about but i think mention them you're not having to go into like full explanations of why do you enjoy board games why do you enjoy this sport or watching that sport or anything like that fine to mention you might have a connection with your interviewer yeah um moving on to like the behavioral stuff on the leadership and the Mm -hmm. conflict resolution uh, what's what's your overarching thoughts about those questions? Yeah, and these are, you know, I, I'm really glad we're doing these these tips too because there were some really good things you did. So certainly for folks watching, be sure to like this video. It's going to help reach more people if you're really enjoying these tips that you are hearing from us. Um, I think what was really good about your answers there in leadership style was pulling examples from multiple different things. So for example, um, in your leadership, you talked about a specific example with your company, but then when we got down to consensus of group, you pulled an example from your Teach for India thing. I think it's important that when people are kind of structuring those questions as more behavioral questions to pull from different examples. You don't want to say, well, let me go back to the same example of here and just elaborate more. We want to see that you can pull from from different things and learn more about you versus just one. I think that was really great that you did. Um, And again, going back to um, answering the question, I wrote on here multiple times and I was taking notes, um, much like your interviewer might do in their interview. Um, of you is circling back and restating your point here. Here's why my leadership style is more of an empathetic approach for strategy. Here's how, you know, and this example was how I really helped to build consensus among people with differing opinions from the principal at the school for Teach for India. So I think those are really good things and things that we really are are looking for. These are questions that you can go a little bit longer because you might need to provide that in-depth context to answer it. Um, so those questions might feel a longer than the tell me about yourself. Um, but I think those are really good, again, providing examples, um, circling back and, and pulling from a variety of examples. That was the really big takeaway. I'm really glad that you highlighted that in your in your answers. Awesome. Uh, by the way, for folks who are watching, uh, Morgan, thanks for sh- saying that. Like the video, it helps us reach more people. Uh, it, it, it helps more people prep for uh, a mock prep for an interview with Fuqua or any other business school. Uh, but I also want to remind folks that Fuqua is uh, offering 200 AFI waivers. So check the link in the chat. I will make sure to throw it in uh, the description later. Uh, and, uh, you know, that helps you save a little bit of money. Um, Morgan, I want to jump to the next cycle, right? So we did the interview. Um, how do you grade the interview? What happens next now? Do you look at my GMAT? Do you look at my essays? Like what 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 happens after? Yeah, I think what's helpful for this is is even before we get to the interview, what what have we done? So before we've even made an interview decision at Fuqua, someone has gone in and read your application. So they have gone, they've looked at your test scores, your undergraduate record, work experience, leadership and involvement. They've read your essays your letter of recommendation. And so we've already met as a committee once and said, hey, we want to interview this person. That's how you get your interview decision is one person has read it. We'll call that person A. So what happens is we then, as I mentioned, uh, with the interviews at Fuqua, the only component of your application that your interviewer will have is your one page resume. So they're not going to see your test scores, your essays. Um, That's why I would say it is helpful to sometimes mention your passions because a lot of that might have come out in the 25 things. Your interviewer has not seen your 25 things. They don't know anything about you except what is on that one page. Um, 
So what happens is, is usually that interviewer is either a second year student or an alum. In the rare case where we're needing capacity, um, it might be a staff member, but that staff member has not seen your application. They have not, don't have any other knowledge of it. Um, they're not able to access your application in our system right. to protect the integrity of that. Um, so what happens is that person, they probably will be taking notes during your interview. That's why you saw me taking notes. Um, they yeah. will be taking notes because there is a form um, that our interviewers will fill out. And I can't give too much of what's on that form because that gives away like way too much of the secret sauce. Um, but there you is an entire interviewing rubric with us. Come on. <laughs> as much as people, I would probably get a lot of likes on this video then of Fuqua reveals complete rubric. Um, but there is a form that they complete that there are specific things that we're looking for in this behavioral interview. You're not going to hear us, you know, ask you, uh, you know, the question from the internship of your your shrunk down to this, you know, size of a pin and dropped into a blender, how you get out. It's nothing like that. It's all behavioral questions, really more of a conversation for us to learn more about you and why are you wanting to pursue an MBA? And why did you decide to apply to Fuqua? What was it about Fuqua that said, I would like to get my MBA from that school if I'm admitted? So that person, they'll complete the form. Um, they then submit it back to us. And then what happens is there's another reader, and we're going to call this reader B, is they go back and they reread your application, um, the same components that the first reader read, but now they're going to have that interview form. And they're going to be able to say, okay, now I can read this with the context of the interview. And I can see, they'll be able to see what the first reader suggested of like, hey, I recommend them to come to interview. Hey, I recommend admit. Um, and so they'll be able to see that. And they're the ones that are coming in. And they're also going to make an admissions decision. Right. Now with that extra data point, the, the interview serves as another data point in your application. And so what happens then is we come back together as a committee and the first and the second reader, they will be in the same committee. Um, and the second reader will usually read out and say, hey, here's my evaluation of this candidate. Um, here's how they've been. Here's how the interview went. In summary, I recommend that we, we should admit this person based on the interview or, or wait list or anything like that. I don't like to talk about the third option because I don't like putting doubt in people's minds. But that's kind of how we're looking at it. So it's not so much if they just call us and say, yep, admit the person. Like there are things that we're looking for in the write-up and we train our interviewers. They go through implicit bias training. Um, we don't match interviewers. So if you magically get paired up with someone and you are in the same industry, that is just by chance and just by luck. We're not saying, okay, this person worked in ed tech. Let's put them with an interviewer that was in ed tech. Um, we try to make it completely random. So that way there, there is no bias or anything like that. But sometimes you do get lucky. If you're in consulting, you might get paired with someone who was a consultant. That just might be a hard industry to avoid there. Um, yeah. But really, they go through training of how to give us information as far as summarizing what was talked about in the interview. How did they do maybe in this category? What was their evaluation of it? And then we do ask them as well, like, what would be your recommendation if you were sitting in admissions committee? And so it's kind of there's two full readers, but there's maybe three people that are contributing to that admissions decision that can give. And there's times that people recommend people for admit. And we might say, mm, based on everything else and all the other components, we know wait list might be better or vice versa. So um, right. an interview can, I think, in more ways help people, but it can be the thing that might say, give us pause or like, oh, gosh, like, what they talked about, what we're seeing in the application isn't matching. I've seen that in applications. So I think that's why when people ask me, what should I do to prep for my interview? Go back through your application. Go back through your resume. Understand your story. It's not going to look good to us if things are vastly different and we're left being like, what? Who was this person that came to the interview versus who wrote this application? Right. No, that makes all sense. Thanks for, th thanks for laying out the process for us. Um, I have two follow-up questions. I think the first one is we missed talking about uh, the why Fuqua question. So maybe we can spend like a minute on that one. The second one was one of the things that I see um, not very often, but it comes up every single year where people have a tendency to self-evaluate their 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 interview. Mm -hmm. And where, where I have seen instances where, uh, you know, somebody would say something like, oh, my interview went really poorly. Uh, my interviewer absolutely hated me. Uh, should I go and talk to the admissions to 
to give me a second chance or stuff. This this happens. This happens more than you would think. Uh, I'm curious if you had an opinion on that part. So those are the two things, and then we can close out. Yeah. So let's go to the the question part of people saying, "Oh, I think I bombed my interview." Um, I, you know, you're so right. There's times where I I chuckle because I can see the interview valuation. Um, and when people like, I, I don't think the person liked me there, I didn't do well. And I'm looking and I'm like, you did great in your interview. This is just a self-conscious. I was in a very vulnerable state. And um, so I think if there is something glaring that you feel like hampered you from talking about your experience or something, um, let's say you realize like the whole time your interview was glitched, your internet connection was glitching and the person might have only heard every third or fourth word you said or something like that. Let us know. I've never like really seen us redo an interview. Usually a lot of times it's that I kind of say imposter syndrome, kind of kicking in a little bit early um, where interviewing is just a very nerve wracking thing. We understand that. And I think um, I always tell myself, if I ever come out of an interview saying I nailed it, chances are I didn't do so well because I'm, I was overconfident. So it's a totally fine, normal feeling. But if you feel like there was something glaring maybe the interview had to stop suddenly because there was a family emergency or some situation like that certainly let us know um but usually we're not then going and saying like this person complained about their interview let's not um you yeah. know usually um usually it's just kind of our own self self-confidence that just feels like that was really vulnerable i don't remember what i said did i answer that well i think too the nice thing about at fuqua is you can always send an update to your application so let's say after your interview, you learned more from your interviewer. I always recommend asking questions about their experience. Let's say you learned more about things or you were like, you know, I, I talked about this in my interview, but I wanted to elaborate more. You can always send this in an update. And just I always say like a letter to the admissions committee. Um, we will review that, too. So if there's something where you're like, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more. We talked about this, but I felt like in the time constraint, I didn't get a chance to dive deep. I, yeah. I wanted to share more. You can always do that. Um, awesome. And then as far as the why Fuqua, I think a, a lot of schools are going to probably ask a variation of this. And that's just, you know, you'll hear a lot in your research of business school is all about fit, um, whether you fit in the program and whether the program is a fit for you. And we want people that genuinely want to be at Fuqua. Um, we want people who are like, this really makes sense for me. If you are coming in and saying, I'm trying to think of an industry off the top of my head, like something that is like not even something like mentioned at Fuqua. And we're like, yeah. well, then why are you applying here? Like then that kind of gives us like, maybe this isn't the right fit for you. And that doesn't mean you're not a great candidate or a great person. It just might mean like, that's just not a fit and that's okay. Um, so yeah. I think with that why Fuqua question, it's great to kind of pull in maybe some of the things you talked about in your second essay or in your application of, why Fuqua, show the research you've done, why, you know, you did a great job of talking about the different clubs and, you know, here, here's what, you know, the centers and Fuqua's uh, emphasis on, you know, ed tech. So I think it's a great place to share your research on Fuqua. I wouldn't use this as a chance of like, well, because I know all these people and this is why I want to be here. Like this chance to say, here's why I'm a fit for the school and why the school is a fit for my career goals. That's really what we're looking for um, in that. And I think you did a great job of, of answering that and kind of in, in a great way of just here are kind of three big buckets of why Fuqua makes sense for me. Right. Awesome. Uh, we are out of time, but I see a lot of really good questions. Um, what I would recommend is when this video ends, leave them as comments. I'll make sure to touch base with Morgan. But Morgan, do you have five minutes to take maybe a couple of questions? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I think um, Rudra asked this question, which I sometimes face this problem. Like, you know, how much of your personality or your humor um, should you feel comfortable in sharing with your interviewer? Yeah, I think certainly personality is a big, big component. So, um, you know, I think be yourself. Um, typically, when you are told, like, don't don't be yourself, you get really rigid and and just like kind of I don't want to say robotic, but that's the word that comes to my mind. It's fine to, to be yourself. Um, as you can see, I'm a person, I talk with my hands. If I was in an interview, I'm still going to talk with my hands. Um, so I think be comfortable. 
don't be sitting in a chair like this and, you know, talking like you're just having coffee or tea with a friend or anything like that. You still want to be professional. So keep humor in mind, too, of, of professional witty humor is fine. Like your comment of like, well, typical, I was from, I'm from India and I was an engineer, like, you know, people that have that context, be like, yep, that's, you know, kind of maybe a personality thing. So I think it's fine to be your personality. Just make sure it's still appropriate. You don't want to be cracking any inappropriate jokes that could offend somebody. But I think be yourself, show your personality. You don't have to be so completely rigid that yeah. it doesn't represent who you are. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, for me, it's a, like a balance. Uh, I would, the interviewer is still a stranger, right? So uh, I, I'm rehearsing the jokes that I want to make with other people sometimes helps. Like, is this okay? So, so like sussing it out. Um, the other question that I want to get to, and then we can absolutely close, is um, if your answer is long and uh, meandering, um, is it okay to uh, giving a, a summary or an agenda? Uh, I think it's like almost necessary, but I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think, you know, especially if maybe you're thinking of the question or if someone is asking you the question, it's fine to say, hey, my leadership style, I would define as, as empathetic. So I'd like to provide you with an example of maybe how I've demonstrated this in a situation. So I think like to your point, provide like an agenda, an overview, but then circle back and say, and that is why I believe my leadership style is one of, of empathy in, in yeah. strategy. I think always circling back. And if you feel like your answer is going long or meandering, it's fine to say, I feel like I'm getting a little long winded. So let me pause there and just, you know, share that, that this is why, to your point, I think you said this before, happy to share more if, if you're interested. But um, I, I think showing that self-awareness of like, I might be going a little long. Do you want me to wrap it up here so we can get to the next question? That's completely fine. Awesome. Um, well, Morgan, we are definitely out of time now, but thank you so much for being so transparent about, you know, what Fuqua cares about, how to actually frame your answers, subtle feedback. This was super, super helpful. Uh, when I did a mock interview, like maybe a couple years ago, I was actually a first year student at Michigan and I was doing a similar video with GMAT Club and that video kind of blew up. So it was good feedback for us that people really like this content and they really like the subtle nuances of how, uh, you know, admissions or second year students or alums uh, respond to a certain answer style. I hope to you know have you over on the GMAT Club channel as much. Uh, a subtle reminder for people, uh, app fee waivers, link in the chat. Like the video so that we can have Morgan come back and do more videos with us uh, or we can do more mock interviews. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Morgan, for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Lovely being here. And again, best of luck on your interviews. I know you all will do great. Thanks.